Hello, Gerard. Hello, Rod. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you. Good. So we're here to talk about Candide by Voltaire, mm. right? Which you have just That's read right. this week, right? You just read it this week, so it's fresh in your mind. I, and, and I finished I it this week. week. Oh, good. And I get to pick your brain about it. So uh, looking forward to that, looking forward to that. So okay. first of all, who, who was Voltaire? Who was Voltaire? He was a philosopher, writer, lived in France in the 18th century. Troublemaker, mm. challenging the authorities of the day, the religious authorities and monarchs and mm -hmm. military. Yeah. Poking fun at them. And it got him into trouble. He was imprisoned, exiled, well, self-exiled, because he was always worried he'd be locked up. Mm -hmm. Was he ever locked up? Yeah. He was he was in the Bastille for, for a while. Not for that long. Mm -hmm. Some people associate him with uh, you know, atheism. Do you agree with that assessment? Well, he believed in God, just uh, he was more of a deist mm -hmm. rather than a theist. And the difference being that theist has control of the world every day and you can speak to that God. And But a deist just believes there was a creator, but he's not necessarily too, uh, too interested in what's going on now. He just created the world. I mean, there's many different ideas with deism, but anyway, yeah, you can't really have a conversation with god and not really in control of what's happening now so he did believe in god mm -hmm. okay. Okay. well so what is the book candide about could you give us an overview of candide yeah it's a satirical novella published in 1759 it was immediately banned for, for some of the reasons I, I've just mentioned. It follows the adventures of an innocent young man by the name of Candide as he travels the world, accompanied by the philosopher Pangloss, a man who constantly repeats his conviction that all is for the best in this, the best of all possible worlds. And that's one of the main attacks of this book is on that view that all is for the best. So, yeah, in, in the book, he, he attacks religion and the army, philosophers, human behavior. So he has a go at quite a, quite a few institutions in the book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he so you're saying that Voltaire wrote the book as an attack on the idea that all was for the best possible world. Absolutely, yeah. That, I think that's the main main idea here, text, main philosophy. Was that idea popular in those days? Well, it's uh, a guy called Gottfried Leibniz. Are you aware of him? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know much about him, but yeah, I know the name. Yeah, so... Especially in the, the, the Enlightenment, philosophers had to grapple with that question, why does evil exist? And, you know, in polytheistic cultures, it was easy. You could just blame the bad gods for the, all the bad stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But in a monotheistic culture, it's a bit more difficult. You've got one god who's omnipotent why is he allowing these terrible things to happen and um leibniz rational answer was that it is all happening for the best we just as humans we don't understand why but it is there is a plan there is a divine plan and it's all it's all happening for a reason there's order in the universe man just doesn't simply doesn't understand it and yeah voltaire did not agree with that Mm -hmm. Did he put forth another idea? 
not really. Just <laughs> that there cannot be order in these these terrible events. Um, the book was written during the Seven Years' War, which was a war between England and France, and you know, a million men at arms died in Europe. It was a global war. There was wars in Canada between the French and the English. So, yeah, appalling, appalling things happening, and also the the Lisbon earthquake was 1755, so four years before the book. I think that was the main event, maybe, that changed Voltaire's mind. There is absolutely no order or reason for, for that terrible event. It, it happened, and there's no order to it. Mm -hmm. So the context of the book took place within a time that there was a lot of bad things happening in the world, you're saying? There, there, yeah. There were a lot of things that you know, there was war, there were national, natural disasters, right? And so mm -hmm. how could this view possibly? But w was that a view that you think he held previously? Or do you think he never really held that view? From what I understand, it was especially the, the Lis um, Lisbon earthquake that really thought he, he had to come out and, and argue against Leibniz, yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. So I don't know what his early, his early views were. Mm -hmm. And then there's another character in the book called Matin, who has another idea. He, he has a Manichaeism view. You know Manichaeism? Mm -hmm. it's, it's evil against good. And when bad things are happening in the world, then the evil God has control. And when good things happen, yeah. So he does give another view as well. So it's like it's dualistic, you're saying, it's like a dualism. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Good. Well, the, so the title of the book is Candide or Optimism, right? The, mm. Candide or, or, or Optimism. So mm. is, there, is there any special significance of that title? Well, optimism refers to the philosophical system of Leibniz. So, yeah, front, front and centre, this attack on Leibniz's position. That's why it's why it's called that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, apart from Leibniz, what what else does does he attack in the book? Um, yeah, he wants to attack the abuses of power. And hypocrisy, so religious figures, the, the Inquisition, he attacks for just killing people, uh, rulers for murdering and torturing people. So, yeah, religion, military, uh, monarchy, they all, they all come, come under attack. And, it, and the lesson for Candide is there's not much you can do about it. That whatever you try, if you can try to change these things, it, they happen anyway. And the best you can do is escape, cultivate your own garden. Is that an escape? Which, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the garden, you can have nice walls in your garden and grow fruit and vegetables and look after your own your own world and that's the best way because you can't really alter what's going on in politics and mm -hmm. the heads yeah interesting what do you think about that is do you think tending to our own garden is the is the is the best way for one to live a life well i think voltaire got involved in politics so it's not it's not like completely Shut yourself away, but be aware that it, you know these terrible events are going to happen, right? Earthquakes and, and wars, and yeah. If you spend too long worrying about it and philosophizing about it, you're not going to get very far. So yeah, a lot of a lot of your life should be tending your own garden, um, helping others as well. You know, help those around you, right? In in your garden. You're, you're growing vegetables and fruit and 
that's giving sustenance to people. But it could mean write a book, uh, raise a child, any, anything like that. Still, still be politically aware. Sure, get involved, but but don't don't expect too much. It will only end in disappointment. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So it's kind of like attend to your sphere of influence, I guess. Right. And there's a limit to what you can influence, and that's true for everybody, right? I mean, even if you're like a president or a monarch, right? Um, you're still so limited on in what you can control in, in the world. Yeah. Right. Because things just happen all the time. Yeah. All right. Well, um, yes, I recently read the seven, is it the seven lessons of successful people. <laughs> one of those, what is it? Do you know that one? The book? Yeah. You know I've heard. Yeah, I have. I never read it. I, I never read it. It's one of those. But, but yeah, he talks about that. You should. You you should increase your circle of influence. So things you can change in your life and and around you, and decrease your circle of concern. So just yeah, constantly worrying about things that are really out of your control. I mean, even today, pandemics and climate change you know there's not so much you can do about it so focus on what you can do mm -hmm. sure. and it's it's a message of hope don't you know don't give up even though these terrible things happen don't give up you, you can still focus on what's around you yeah think globally act, act local think globally act locally very good yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So, so back to Candide here. First of all, tell me about tell me about El tell me about El Dorado and um, why did Can Candide leave El Dorado? Yeah, so in this book, he's, he's traveling all over the place, Europe, South America, and he ends up in Peru in a utopian state. Everything's perfect. There's no lawyers. There's material prosperity. Nobody wants to leave. Religion is reduced to being grateful to God, not begging for God to do something for you. So everything's wonderful. But Candide leaves. So why? Um, I, I think there's various reasons people give, but one is maybe a, a fear of boredom. Human desire to keep, keep moving, keep improving a restlessness in humanity um anthropologists today might call it the human need to feel incomplete mm -hmm. it's what sets us apart from other species we're, we're always wanting to move on and improve so yeah we, we can't feel content when everything's perfect I suppose there's no purpose in a way, is there? Yeah. So he left. I mean, it might it might have been simply that he left to chase this woman that he'd been chasing the whole book. Kunegonde. Kunagond. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, she wasn't there, so he, he left. Possibly one of the reasons to, to go and find her. Yeah. Well, that can motivate you to do a lot, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, well, that's interesting, you know, so in El Dorado, they didn't pray to God for things, they prayed to God with gratitude. Gratitude, I mean. Yeah, wow, that's an, I think there's something important there, right? I mean. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I feel like so, so much of religious thought is surrounded around this idea that, you know, praying to God to like, you know, for for some outcome that I'm desiring, right? And yeah. the idea of just like being grateful in, instead, you know, e even when things are not that great, 
you know, there, there seems to be really something powerful there, right? Because it it, it kind of opens up something in, in your heart, I guess, that even in the face of like suffering, it's like, it just becomes a lot, um, you can experience like joy in the midst of suffering or something, you know? So, um, yeah, that's interesting. But he still left, you know? So that, you know, that's an interesting thing. Yeah. Yeah. He's still there. Well, ultimately, he chose. Oh, go ahead. What's that? Well, it was a very wealthy state. There was gold lying around on the floor, so he he became very wealthy. And that's another idea: is that he left to share this wealth and do good in the world, right? Which ultimately failed because when he when he left and went back to Europe with all this wealth, people just robbed him of it. So... Yeah, he lost everything. Right? He 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 loses everything in the book. Right? He. He goes from being like uber wealthy to losing everything, right? And and what kind of what kind of attitude did he maintain throughout all the all that change? Well, he he starts off believing in Pan Gloss, Pan Gloss's ideas that this is the best world, but slowly that does change throughout the book. I think he realizes that too many terrible things happen and there is no reason for it so he does i think he makes that that change and then the biggest thing is at the end uh, this this idea that have a garden grow some fruit that's the best way, way way forward and and work hard in the garden so that when you go to sleep at night you're physically tired but you but satisfied because you you've done something mm hmm but it also sounds like he chose to remain in the world too, right? Because he could have stayed in El Dorado where everything was, was perfect. And he chose to leave and go back into the world where that is less, less than ideal. Right. And yep. he found a way to live in the world with a, almost like a compromise between the two, right? Where you, you, you pay very deep attention to what you are, I guess what you're assigned to in your in your own life, right? Mm -hmm. But also not leaving it either and like shunning it, right? There's a, there's definitely there seems to he seems to, to maintain some kind of openness toward um toward the world too, where you're not just yeah. turning, you know, you you're not just shutting yourself off. You're staying in it, but you're but you're also paying most of your attention to to what's going on in your own field of of existence right <clears throat> yes so a balance between the two yeah. mm -hmm. sounds good yeah what was your big then, take i was going to say that the other thing he talks about he, he briefly mentioned slavery oh yeah and there's a great there's a great line which i'm going to read out so Candide in uh, in South America meets a, a mutilated slave. And the slave tells him this, when we work in the sugar mills and get a finger caught in the machinery, they cut off the hand. But if we try to run away, they cut off the leg. I have found myself in both situations. It is the price we pay for the sugar you eat in Europe. Boom. Mm hmm. Wow. Apparently, wow. Voltaire Voltaire liked his sugar, so a um, bit of guilt coming out there. Maybe. Yeah. Wow. That I mean, it seems to be quite an indictment of the whole European imperialistic project. <laughs> right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Just to finish, Rod, I'm going to read a few of Voltaire's quotes. Mm hmm. These are not from the book, but I've got three. One is on freedom. I'm sure you've heard these before, but you might not know they're from Voltaire. This is on freedom of speech. He says, I detest what you write, but I would give my life to make it possible for you to continue to write it. Mm -hmm. Yes. And on religion, he says, those who make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. Mm -hmm. And 
Final quote from Voltaire. It is forbidden to kill. Therefore, all murderers are punished unless they kill in large numbers and to the sound of trumpets. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. So the, the warfare killer, right? <laughs> yeah. Or it's like, what, yeah. what did Stalin say, right? He said, one death is a tragedy. A million deaths is a statistic. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So he was very good on, on his, uh, his quotes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, he was renowned for his wit, right? I mean, he was a very witty. Yeah. I mean, I, what, what I loved about Candy, and it's been a long time since I read it, but I, I just I love the speed of it, actually, right? It, it's a very fast paced. It's very swift. You know, he he never dwells on, on anything. But yeah, breakneck, breakneck speed. Definitely. And so he doesn't and dwell on anything too long. And so he, he he throws these great ideas at you, but in such a succinct way that you, you just have to keep moving forward, right? And, and you can't get stuck anywhere with them, which I like. So, and that's what happens in, in Candy's life, right? I mean, he, he goes through so many changes in such a short period of time, right? Where he's rich and he's very poor and, right? And just all these big changes that happen very quickly. And, uh, I think as as the reader, you're you're kind of forced into this situation where there's no one destination where you're like, okay, this is it, right? It's it's just this constant moving forward kind of thing that that's happening, you know. So I like that about him a lot. And absolute horrors that befall everyone in the book. I mean, slavery, rape, yeah. whippings, uh, mutilation. Everything happens. Yeah. 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 Right, it, it's quite a a contemplation on suffering, <laughs> right? Yeah. But there's humor in the face of suffering too. So it's like, you know, he, he finds a way to to portray it with humor, right? So it's yeah, it's a, it's quite masterful, quite a masterful yeah. work for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, what was your big takeaway? I mean, what in the end, what was your like, this is what I think was very valuable about this book. Oh, the first takeaway has got to be the, the cultivate your own garden. That's the last line. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, and the, um, the whole argument against Leibniz. I think that's the central theme of the book. Yeah. Yeah. This idea that there's, there's an omnipotent God because, because there is no answer to the, the horrors of the, of, the, of the earth, are there? For me, so I, I agree. And I, I can get on board with some, some deism. You know, there was a creator, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Not that he's in charge now. So. Yeah. Well, the, the Indians have a, a good answer to it, I think. I mean, it, it's the best answer I've ever heard about it, to... Um, mm -hmm. You know, how, how do you account for suffering and, and bad things happening in the world? And their view is just everything is Brahman, right? And so it's just, it's just Brahman has an infinite potential for an infinite amount of manifestations. And therefore, that's going to include things that you may not like individually, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so um, I've always found that to really be. A, quite a good answer to it because I, I think a lot of the the debate of like you know how could there be so much evil in the world is you know so much of what we call evil are, are merely things we simply don't like right mm -hmm. and so but another person does right i mean like like i think about this like in the u.s right um you have like trump right who many people think is evil and then many people think he's like the best thing that ever happened and so from when you take like a more like Brahmin perspective, right, that the Indians do, you kind of step back and you just see all of it as really just a manifestation of one thing. And, mm. you know, that's for me, that's always been the, the most convincing view, I think, on the on, on the subject. It's and in, and in the, not dualistic, actually, completely not a dualistic. In that view, is there a plan to it all? 
like Leibniz? Not a plan in terms of, um, that's, a, that's an interesting question actually, because in terms of the span of a human life, I think you could argue that the answer would be yes, in the sense that the human being's journey is one from ignorance to knowledge of Brahman, right? That, I mean, this is what, what the Indians say, right? And so then that, and they believe that's true for everybody, okay? And um, even if, and it doesn't matter where you are in terms of like level of understanding of that, um, no matter where you are on that journey, we're all heading in that same direction of, of getting out of ignorance, the darkness of ignorance into like the light of knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, so the human life, yes. But when it comes to the ultimate, like what happens when you get there? Is there, was there some plan or something, you know, the super consciousness, if you want to call it that? It's just completely unknowable. And I think um, the Indians are really, the Vedanta especially, it's just they're very careful not to answer that with like, yes, this is the purpose. You know, because once they, because you know, the view there is once you define it, it's, it's, it's no longer that thing, right? Like <laughs> once you define something like that, it, it, that can no longer be true. So yeah. um, it's just really about, I guess, maintaining a certain perspective. And so, uh, you know, but, but I, I've always found that to be a very sophisticated view of reality because it, it doesn't deny anything. It doesn't shun anything either. It doesn't, um, it doesn't even reject anything. But nor does it tell you that, oh, you know, there's nothing you can do about anything. You know, it, I think like Voltaire, you know, there, there is a place for, uh, you know, acting within your sphere of influence yeah. to make the world better, for sure. Um, or your life better or other people's life around you better. Um, so it, it's definitely not nihilistic in any way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There's also a place where you can um, resign yourself too to the the idea that you know you can become very accepting of of what you don't like and in fact you know from this perspective you're better off actually um, for growth you know you're, you're actually better off uh, facing things you don't like as often as possible, <laughs> right? Because it it can force you into into a wider range of of, um, of what's good. And I think that points to something that happened in Candide, right? He he found a place where everything was perfect and and realized that there's great danger in too much comfort, right? Where we you no longer yeah. uh, strive, you you no longer grow, mm -hmm. you're no longer longing for anything, no longer uh, trying for anything so i you know i think um you know there, there's something to be said about suffering itself as a motivator to uh to expand oneself you know so yes a heavy warm coat is very comfortable but it doesn't help you spread your wings no no i think people need to struggle a little bit right i mean and i don't mean you should have strife the way Candy did, right? I mean, that was pretty extreme, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think people really, I, in my view, I think people are most happy. It seems, I've just observed this over and over, when they have something in their life that forces them to keep expanding somehow and to keep growing yeah. and to keep learning. No matter what that is, I mean, the vehicle could be anything, you know? It could be computer programming, you know? It could be whatever it is that you're into but uh if it's if it's causing you to you know to to try to ex, ex, expand yourself then then i would say it's a good thing you know so for me it's making a, a youtube video on candid <laughs> yeah well, well well there you go because then you then you have to read the book yes and exactly yeah make and, some notes yeah Make some notes, be prepared, right? All of it is very much to the good, for sure. Yeah. Well, very good. Shall we, is there any last points that you would like like, like to make? No, no, all, all done.
right. Well, I'll, I'll finish with this. I mean, just again, pan gloss. When Candide is in trouble during the the, the earthquake, and he asks, I, I don't, I can't remember what he asked for, water or bread or something. Uh, Pangloss doesn't do anything because again, he's just absolutely fixed in this idea that this is all for the best and it's all for a reason. So don't get in, you know, don't get involved, and, and that is what we should uh, shy away from. Still, still act absolutely. Mm -hmm, do what you can. Help, yeah, help that's yeah, that's that's very important. I think to remember that true escape. You know, you, you used the word escape earlier, and mm. I think I don't think I, I personally I wouldn't characterize Voltaire's solution as necessarily an escape. Like there's an escape element to it for sure. Like you know, just get into your own thing. But um, I would say that it's probably the best possible approach you could take, right? You know, during your lifetime is to you stay in the world, you stay open to it, you acknowledge the suffering and you acknowledge the suffering of others and, and, and do what you can to help. But you also don't, I just see this happen to so many people who they want to change the world, right? And it's just, nobody has ever successfully done that as far as I'm aware, right? So, uh, no, it's going to end up in a lot of disappointment. Absolutely. absolutely. Or even if you, you think you're changing the world for a better place, but you're, you're not. Your right, because mind. everyone's got their blind spots, and your vision has all kinds of dark spots in it that you're that you're not aware of. So, even if you are able to implement your your vision, it it will come with many new problems, <laughs> right? That have to be solved later. So, we see that over and over again. Like this is the solution. Like one solving one problem often creates a hundred new problems, right? So, you know, and nobody has the omniscience to know like this is what the result is actually going to be right so yeah so yeah tend to your own garden for sure mm -hmm. nice okay Rob. all right well done well done thank you